Welcome to Life After Business, the podcast, where I bring you all the information you need to exit your company and explore what life can be like on the other side. This is Ryan Tansom, your host, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome back to the Life After Business podcast. Ryan Tansom here. Today's guest's name is Norm Brodsky. So excited that I got him on this show. I got an introduction to Norm via Bo Burlingham, where they co-wrote together Street Smarts. Norm was one of the main examples in Small Giants and also in Finish Big that Bo wrote. And those two together wrote 10 series of articles in Inc. Magazine documenting the entire sale process that Norm had for City Storage and then was on the cover of Inc. Magazine when it says Norm decides to sell, and he actually pulled the deal off the table for a variety of reasons that he gets into in the podcast. But not only did he go through the eventual sale and sold City Storage for $110 million because they had $10 million in EBITDA, but he just ended up selling the real estate for $160 million. And Norm gets into all of the things that he learned from taking his first business from zero to $120 million and then bankrupt into building City Storage and the great company that he eventually sold. Talks about the culture and the strategy and all the things that he did the second time in City Storage that he wish he would have done the first time and all the things that he's learned and what he's up to today as he is an investor and mentor for a lot of other entrepreneurs that are lucky enough to have his advice. So I really hope you enjoy this episode. It's been one of my favorites. Without further ado, here's Norm Brodsky. How's it going, Norm? It's going well, Ryan. Thank you so much for coming on the Life After Business podcast. Well, I'm glad to be here today. So the reason that we finally got to this show is because Bo, one of my favorite authors and kind of the the reason I'm doing what I am today, introduced us and I had come across your name from a lot of his stories and you have got an awesome background that I'm excited to kind of dive into. And for a listener's sake, if they haven't uh, come across Bo or any of the the articles that you guys wrote together, can you kind of give our listeners a little bit of a brief brief background of where you came from and and where where you are today? Okay, well, that's brief. I'm not sure I can do, but I'll give you some sort of a background. The highlights. So um, I don't usually tell the story, but I graduated as an attorney and practiced for about five years, and I hated it, and I always wanted to be a businessman. So uh, what I did is, uh, when I was starting out in business many years ago, uh, this country was just at the end of its manufacturing cycle. You could see that the future was service businesses. So I went to work in three or four different service businesses to find what I liked. I finally found one and uh, started my first business. And um, that, the first business I started was in 1979. And I grew that business from zero to $120 million in a period of about uh, six years. Uh, I made the Inc. 500 list um, three times in a row at that time. And I thought that I was probably the smartest guy I ever knew. And, uh, but I found out later in life that uh, uh, it takes a lot to understand business and to do business. And I took that business from $120 million to zero in about eight months. Um, it wasn't funny then, and it certainly isn't funny now. But I learned a lot of lessons from that business. And from there, I built other businesses that I've sold for um, lots of money. My desire when I first went into business was to run a $100 million business. You know, every day I walked into work, I would ask, um, how much do we do in sales? And I think that most entrepreneurs, um, that's their main interest. How much do we do in sales? Well, I learned through that failure that I went through um, that it's not how much you do in sales. It's how much of the sale you keep, how much of the money you keep. What are your profit? What are your margins? And... um, so learned lots of lessons, and uh, since that time, I've probably started about 12 or 14 different businesses. Some of them have been successful. Some of them we've had to close, 
and I've learned lots of life lessons along the way. So that's sort of a brief history, Ryan, of uh, where I was and how I got to where I am today. Along the way, I met an interesting guy named Bo Burlingham, uh, and we um, together have written together for the last 20 some odd years. Uh, we've written a book together and um, um, I've learned an awful lot about business. Um, and that book and uh, just uh, your, your, your guys' material together is fantastic and it must have been just an awesome experience being able to write with Bo and get to know him for 20 years like that. I mean, some of the stuff that you guys done, have done is amazing. And one of the books uh, is Street Smarts. One of the one of my favorite books because of how practical it is, and it's written by yourself and Bo, who you've been there, done that. So it's it, g- tell me a little bit about the experience of why why did you start, why did you decide to write that book? Well, it's really interesting. That book has been um, uh, disseminated in, in uh, twelve different languages now, and it was first published under the name of the Knack um, about seven years ago and it still sells well today um you know i had all this information and and knowledge in my head from uh what i had gone through both the good things and some of the uh, mistakes i made and and i really wanted to pass this on to others um so they could learn from it you know they say uh, i'm a very very uh smart person and most entrepreneurs I know are smart. And that's not a good thing. <laughs> because smart people have to learn their own lessons. Uh, and they make their own mistakes. Wise people, on the other hand, are, are people who learn from other people's mistakes. So even though I'm smart, you're better off being wise than smart. So I wanted to pass some of this business on so some of the wise people could learn from it. And so that was the initiative to write this particular book. Well, and and it, it is the most practical. I, I mean, the amount of information that we would have learned by by going through that book years in advance. I mean, just the relationships from your advisors, what matters, what you should be thinking about. It's a fantastic book, and you know, from Street Smarts, and then you're mentioned in Small Giants by Bo. You're also uh, big into the Finish Big um, story that he wrote, and it goes back to two things that I want to kind of to dive into because that first service business that you had was in the, the mail and data processing business, correct? And you in, in the delivery business basically. Delivery. Yes. And and you grew it so fast through acquisitions and t- tell me can you give us a little bit of a, you know, synopsis of what 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 happened where all of a sudden you went from 0 to 120 million and then back down again? What were some of the things that you we're faced with that that forced that situation. So, so when I started the business, um, you know, I, I grew through both acquisition and opening up new businesses. I, I did both of those things. And by the time 1987 came along, I started the business in 79. Uh, the business was probably one of, if not the largest uh, business of that kind in the United States. And uh, like I said before, I thought it was really smart. And, and I could have, what, what really saved my future, and the biggest lesson I learned from that is every time something happens to us in business, um, we have something to do with it. And we tend to blame others. And if we blame others for what happened or outside forces what happened, then don't introspectively look at ourselves, we're destined to repeat the same mistakes over and over again. I call it the Groundhog's Day Syndrome. And I'll give you an example. So in 1987, for those of you who remember, there was a huge in November stock market crash. It was the, it was the biggest crash since 1929. And um, I had a business, part of my business had done um, financial printing. And the financial printing business was a billion dollar business. And we did about 30 or $35 million for the financial printers. And their business went from a billion dollars because of the stock market crash to zero. So I could have blamed uh, the loss of all that business and the downfall of my business on that. At the same time, uh, the first fax machines were coming into being. 
And since we were delivering a lot of envelopes and a lot of letters and things of that nature on a rush basis, um, the fax machine afforded people, they didn't have to give it to a, a messenger or a courier. They could just send it over, the, over their fax machine. So I could have blamed it on that uh, because there were uh, just as many delivery services but less envelopes to deliver. But when I sat down and I looked at what had happened, both those two things had happened and they contributed to the downfall of the business, the biggest thing that I did and the mistake I made is one segment of my business, the original business I started, was like a money machine and it was great. And I had pledged the assets of that business into the other businesses, the ones that were caused and failed by the fax machines and by the stock market crash. And if I hadn't done that, I would have had problems and I would have lost a pretty big part of my business, but I wouldn't have lost it all. So, lesson one, look what you contributed to the loss of your business. And so how that affected me later on was really important. Because today, if I have a business that's a cash cow and generating cash, and I want to open up an adjunct or different type of business related to that, I open up an entirely separate business. I don't pledge the assets of one business to another business. I have to have the money to be able to do that and the wherewithal. So I don't intermingle the businesses. So if I hadn't done that introspection into what I contributed to the mistake, I would have repeated the same mistake over and over again. And so that's well, a well. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. I I, I have to say how you worded that in your book and how you've gone about looking at that and not blaming others. I, I have unbelievable amount of respect for you because in it re, and it really shows how you took that to heart in your future businesses too. Because. I mean, what was it like firing and laying off that many people? I mean, that had to have been devastating because you had that $100 million golden carrot that you were trying to chase, and next thing you know, the rugs pulled out from underneath you. Yeah, well, it was the, the most devastating part was that firing all the employees. There were thousands of employees in that company that I had to let go, and I swore that I would never put at jeopardy and risk of my employees again. So today, uh, when I open up a new business, let's say I project it's going to cost me a million dollars. So what I do is um, I, I go through, if I go through that million dollars and I'm still not there, I've already mentally and uh, reserved another 25%. So I, I know when I'm putting up a million, I better have a million and a quarter. And after that, I don't chase dollars anymore. I might close that business down. So, so number one, I don't take, even though I'm a risk taker, and most entrepreneurs are risk takers, I just don't go to the edge of the cliff and look down anymore. Um, a long time. The other thing is that when I, uh, when I started out, I wanted to reach $100 million in business. And really is that you don't want to reach a goal in sales. You want to build a profitable business. Because when you build a profitable business, um, two things happen. Uh, the first thing, you stay in business. And the second thing, the value of the business uh, increases. You know, I say two things. Build a business as if you're going to keep it forever. And build a business as if you're going to sell it. Now, they may seem incongruous to each other, but they're really not. You build a business like it's going to last forever. If you do that... You take no shortcuts. You don't hire from competitors. Uh, you don't uh, look at the short range thing. You take a longer range. Uh, you train your employees properly because you're going to be in business forever. And build the business as if you're going to sell it, whether you're going to sell it or not. Because if you want to sell a business, what do you do? You want to get the most for the business. So in order to get the most for the business, you have to have a good team, number one, and you have to have best practices. So if you take those two things into consideration, you're going to build a hell of a business, whether you sell it or not. It's going to be the most profitable business. And you can so enjoy it the whole time. <laughs> well, I, I don't know about enjoying it the whole time. <laughs> Lots of pressures and problems that come with businesses. But if, if, if you do that, you're under a different type 
of, of, of auspices, a, a different type of thing. And it's fun. I mean, I love business. I don't think that until I'm uh, mentally and physically unable, I, I'll continue to build businesses. So you took all of those practices after that first business into city storage as you grew city storage. And I think that's why right. you're one of the staple stories that Bo talks about in, in Small Giants. Explain as you're building this business, so city storage, how you implemented some of these things and what were some of the things that you did drastically different than the first time? Well, um, a lot of drastic things that I did differently than the first time is, number one, I built the business that was going to last forever, and I built the business like I was going to sell it. And I built, uh, with the help of my wife, who came and worked with me in that business for, uh, for uh, almost since the inception, we built a, a lasting culture within that business. So I, I discovered along the way also, you know, my dad was a custom peddler. That's a door-to-door -door salesman. Uh, for those of you who don't remember. And I uh, was before the advent of credit cards and department stores. And um, he, he sold door to door. And so um, I went back to some of his sayings, you know. Um, I said, Dad, how do you make a profit? He says, it's real simple. You buy something for a dollar and you sell it for two dollars. And uh, the one thing that he taught me that didn't prove to be true was he used to say the most important thing you have in business is your customers is your most important asset now he could say that because he had no employees he worked by himself but what i discovered along the way is that the most important asset you have in business are your personnel and once i understood that and discovered that um business became easier because it's the people that needed the culture and the respect and if i did that and took care of the people then they would take care of the customers. So that was a really important lesson, building that culture, you know. Well, and explain what your wife did too, because wasn't your wife kind of the, the spearhead when she brought in a consultant and then, you know. Well, you she, didn't bring, she didn't bring in a consultant. What she did was she um, actually um, went and learned about culture. Uh, she, she hired the, the telephone doctor to teach her how to teach her people how to answer the phones, in, in a good way. Uh, she went to uh, 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 Zingerman's. She went to their uh, leadership school. She, she went uh, to uh, Jack Stack, uh, an open book management, to find out what that was all about. My wife garnered information and brought it back to the company and implemented it within our company. So um, she was a big moving part of why our company culture was so great. How would you define company culture? Um, that's a really difficult question to answer, but I'll try in saying that it's the way that the employees are treated within the company. It's um, it's like it's like having a family, and if you consider your employees not your workers but part of your family, um, every you know at home you have a culture, whatever it is. Um, so it, that's basically what it is. Don't forget you're at work probably more than you're at home. You know, most mm -hmm. entrepreneurs aren't working eight hours a day. Uh, if they are, I'd like to know what business they're in. I probably started. <laughs> right. You know, so, so you're there lots and lots of hours. So why not have a good time? Why not enjoy what you're doing? Why not enjoy the people you're with? And why not the people who come to work? Why not? they have those same privileges as liking going to work, wanting to go to work, enjoying themselves at work, and, and sharing in what work throws off to the, to the owners of the company. Because they're the ones in the end who are doing most of the work. If you, know, if you have a, a company that has employees, which most of us do. Well, and you had some really crazy cool stories about how you were able to actually quantify that. So... Tell us a little bit about that one story when that one customer did a tour of your facility, and there was oh a sure. So so um, in the end, I, I'm I'm a I love to sell. I I think of myself. You said your dad was a great salesperson, and I consider myself a great salesperson. And as my obligation to 
undertake more and more of running the company came about as the company grew. I didn't get out to sell as much as possible. So what I did is I insisted that our salesperson bring our prospects to our facility. Um, and I would help close the account, or at least I would bring the, uh, the, uh, uh, the prospective customers to us. And we'd walk through the facility. And so we had probably at the top of our um, company, in this particular company, about 500 employees. And as I walked through the warehouse, um, each, each customer, uh, each uh, employee would say, hi, Norm. And I would say, hi, Joe, or hi, Mary or hi, Dolores, or whoever it was. And uh, the customer looked at me, she said, you know everybody's name? I said, yeah. She says, that's amazing. I said, well, I don't think so. <laughs> well, it, it, it takes something to know everybody's name. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did little tricks like they had to be introduced to myself and my wife when um, they first came to work. And then every few weeks we'd hand out their paychecks before it was direct deposit. Uh, so we got to really know these people. And and I walked through one, and uh, uh, one of the young ladies just had her hair cut. She had long hair, and it was short. And I, and I said to her, oh, Denise, that, what a nice haircut. He says, you recognize that she got a haircut yesterday? <laughs> I said, yeah, why? You know, because I would be through the warehouse all the time. And these people would say, oh, we didn't prod them. We didn't tell them what to do. They'd say hello to the customers. Um, they seemed happy. And so um, usually um, uh, in order to get a customer, they, they'd send some people through and then maybe it had to go up uh, before the board of directors or maybe it had to go up to somebody else to make a decision. And it took time. Uh, uh, our typical close took us 22 months to close. Uh, uh, but so anyway, this customer walked through and, and the woman who was was charge of making the decision was the one who came through the um, through the facility and she said I can't believe it and we had this big chart up and this chart showed that every 50 do 50,000 boxes we put away the customers uh, uh, of new business uh, every employee in the facility got a check and the checks would start at a hundred dollars and they climb a ladder up until they got to the top of the ladder, which is five thousand dollars, so they got a check for a hundred on fifty thousand. The next fifty, they would get a check for two hundred, and so on. And um, we we showed this game that we played with the employees. Is one of the games we played. And when we went upstairs, uh, my wife said, "What did you think?" And the employee says, "I've never seen this before in my whole life, where the employees were happy." where they were smiling, where they were interactive, where they said hello with smiles. She says, I want to make sure that they get to the next 50,000 soon enough, so we're going to give you our boxes. That's so yeah. cool. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. So I got a question for you because you have got a very big personality, and you obviously, when, when you're running City Storage, you absolutely loved your employees. You've, you put a, such an emphasis on culture and your interaction with clients. I know that we, at our business, that was, I mean, you take pride in that, right? You win the customer. We had some really awesome clients. That, the clients become friends, too. And, you know, if you go back to John Warlow, the built-to-sell model, and all, the, all, the, all these thoughts about how the business owner is supposed to run their company, you know, you're not supposed to be 100% reliant on you as, as a company. So how do Correct. you how do you take that specifically in city storage? How did you have the relationship with the clients and your employees and have that that passion without having everything rely on you? Well, that's really interesting, and it's and and obviously as you get bigger and you get more customers, it's a lot more difficult to do. So. One of the last things I would do when we were about to sign a contract with our customers is we, we'd, we'd either be in our place or their place uh, in, in the contract signing. And I would, here would be a typical thing that I would say. I would, uh, let's say uh, Brad, our salesperson, brought in the account, or Patty, our saleswoman, brought in the account. I would say, um, you know, your contact at this company is Brad or, or Patty. But if you ever have a problem that they can't solve, 
here's my cell phone number. You can call me day or night, and I will answer the phone for you. But really, your contact is them. And also, here's the head of customer service. You can call her or him, whoever it was at the time. So what happened was, I don't think my phone rang once or twice a year from a customer who I have this relationship with. The customer knew that I was the final say. They knew if they needed to get a hold of me, they can. But I'll tell you, when you put it that way, they never abuse it. Mm-hmm. They only do it when they're frustrated enough that they can't deal with it. And the salespeople or the customer service people appreciated that because of the fact I wasn't overstepping their bounds. That's a, um, uh, that's a yeah. very applicable one. It's very actionable. You, you've just, it's, you're setting expectations, right? Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and that's, that's how I kept that line going uh, between, between everybody, uh, period. The other thing is that um, we, I would have the, the um, salespeople uh, occasionally take the customer service people to visit the client. So the client knew that they didn't have to bother the salespeople all the time. There was somebody else in the company. You know, a lot of times when you have salespeople, you have customer service reps on the telephone, the client never sees who they are, even though they talk to them every day. So we wanted to bridge a little bit of that gap. So we would either, if the customer would come to our facility, we'd pick them up and take them to our facility so they can meet their customer service reps that they only talk to on the phone. Or we would do it the opposite way around. Take the customer service people out of here, go to the customer's facility to meet them. So it was they had more of a personal relationship to do that. Right. And then there were and then there were touches. You know, you should touch your clients all the time. One of the things I like to uh, tell people is do things that are unusual that the customer doesn't normally, you know, I, I'm not talking about an email. I'm talking about when they first came to us, we'd handwrite them a note, usually for my wife, saying, and mail it, snail mail, you know. Uh, and, and people stop doing that where, mm-hmm. where they would get that. Um, we also like to, I tell people, differentiate yourself, differentiate yourself. You know, everybody sends out uh, holiday cards or season cards. It wouldn't it be nicer and to send, do something that nobody else does? Forget about holiday cards. You can't tell me, I, I'm sure you get 20, 50, 100 holiday cards, right? And if I asked you if so-and-so gave you a holiday card, chances of you remembering are pretty slim. I'm not talking about normal people like family and things of that nature. So that doesn't stand out. It's nice to have it, but it doesn't stand out. How about if you sent your customers, you found out when their birthday is, and you sent them a birthday card? You'd probably be the only vendor who sent them a birthday card. That stands out. Mm-hmm. So there's ways of you to find ways of standing out from the crowd. Don't do what everybody else does. And Think then the, about what everybody else doesn't do. Well, and then all those multiple touches mitigate the risk of the client relying on you. It, mitig- it mitigates. Listen, he, here's the deal. The company is, is, is the customer, not me. If I would take myself out and put somebody in my company in my stead, they'd still deal with the company. You have to, you have to, what most people are afraid of is they're afraid of their salespeople. They feel if the salespeople leave, um, they're going to uh, take some customers with them. So if you take a customer and he has other contacts in the company, even if the salesperson leaves, uh, your chances of retaining that customer are great because you should let them know they're the salespeople, they're great, but customer service people handles it, you handle it, uh, all sorts of things. So if they know that, um, that the company is who they're dealing with, not just one person, whether it be you or the salespeople. When you did something really crazy with your salespeople, because I, I managed 15 copier sales reps at one point. I mean, you're talking that that exact situation is, you know, we had contracts, so there's a little, le- there's less risk there. But right. you hired different, like I always was, you know, trying to find the, the big bad wolf that was the, the hunter that would go, you know, 
you know, create a huge book of business, but you did the, like almost the exact opposite and how you did your comp plans was super crazy. Can you give us a little bit of a rundown? Cause I mean, it was way different than the, the norm. So I don't believe in paying sales commissions. That's what you're talking about. Yeah. And you, and you never wanted yeah. to hire someone like yourself, which it's funny. Well, that, that's a, that's a different story. So we'll start with the hiring first. If you want, I have a few rules for hiring, uh, particularly salespeople. Uh, number one, uh, they had had two prior jobs, so not necessarily in sales, by the way, but two prior jobs. Now, why two prior jobs? Well, when a person goes out in their first job, a man or woman goes out in their first job, uh, no matter what it is or no matter how much they love it, they're going to think another company's better. Always. <laughs> they just are. They're going to get restless. They're going to leave, especially today with the millennials. Uh, you know, they're, they're quick to leave. Now they go to the second job. When they're at that second job, they understand two different types of culture. They understand that every company is different. Then they understand what they want and what they're looking for. So if they had two prior jobs, the third job, they're going to be looking for what fits them. They didn't do that the first time because they have never no idea. The second time, they weren't aware of different things. Now they're they're aware that different companies treat people different ways in a different culture. So you have a better chance of keeping them uh, after two jobs. So, so, so that's the first thing, two jobs. The second thing, I never, never, never hire from competitors. Now, wh why is that? Well, if you know my philosophy, which I discussed with you a few minutes ago, is you're, you're um, building your company that so it'll last forever. When you do that, you take no shortcuts. Now, why are you hiring from competitor? Chances are you're uh, looking for a shortcut. You feel maybe they'll bring some accounts. And even if they're honest, uh, they have backlog and they're about to close some accounts. So they're bringing you leads. The problem with hiring from competitors is um, they learn one way. They may not want to learn what you're doing. They may. It, it's a different thing. And anybody who would go from one competitor to another and take accounts or leads will do the same thing for you mm -hmm. when they leave. Mm -hmm. so, so, so that's another thing. Third thing is never, 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 never hire a hot shot. <laughs> so, so what's a hot shot? Well, I'm a hot shot. I wouldn't hire a guy like me. You know, um, People who, who are smarter than you, people who walk faster than you, talk faster than you, um, you're never going to keep up with them. And they're not going to fit within the company culture themselves. It's not going to be. Hot shots, they may be great salesmen and saleswomen, but they never work out in the long run. You know, So, so um, that's basically some of the rules I have when I, I'm hiring salespeople. I, I, I think it's super good advice for anybody that's got a sales force because it, I mean, I've experienced all those challenges <laughs> in every single one of those categories. So, so, so you're, you're, you're smart, not wise, but most of us have, <laughs> you know? Right. Um, so I, I want to add a, a more of a strategic tactical question about when you were looking at your business model and you're looking towards the future and you're playing the long game, like you've, you've talked about in building a company that can last or that's sellable. You, there was one specific thing that you had said, in, and I, I don't know in which uh, one of your articles or, or stories it was, when you looked at the business that you were in differently. So City Storage was you know, storing boxes and, for, and documents for law firms and a lot of other bigger companies, but you had mentioned that you were in the real estate business all of a sudden. Can you explain? So, yeah. So, so the question is, so I started this business, right? this uh, archival retrieval and management business. And I had a very difficult time getting uh, my first few customers. And so I sat down and I said, what, what, what business am I in? And that's an important question everybody should answer themselves. Sure, I was in the business of storing boxes and stuff like that. But when I figured out what business I was in, um, and, and, and and I figured out it was the real estate business for small boxes. I was renting out little spaces for boxes. It became easier for me to understand how to sell this business. 
So I, I decided I was in a real estate business. And so therefore, when there's lots of apartments for rent in the real estate business, and there's not whole bunches of people to rent them, there's more supply than demand, what does the real estate people do? Well, the first thing they do is they say, well, we're not going to pay a commission. Uh, you, we'll do it commission free. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to give you uh, free space. Uh, we're not going to charge you the first month's rent. Uh, all sorts of incentives to get the customers in to start with, because they know when somebody moves into their apartment, their apartment building, it's not only a one year, uh, even though it's a one year lease, let's say in New York City, uh, I'm sure the average is somewhere around two and a half or three and a half years uh, where the people stay there and stuff like that. Um, so once I started running this like a real estate business with open space, uh, two things happened. One, when I got new space because I was in a real estate business and cubic foot, not square foot counted, meaning that the higher the building and the higher the thing, the more boxes I can get in and pay the same for the ground lease. Uh, at that time, in the beginning, it was $4 a square foot, whether the building was 10 feet high or 30 feet high. And I can get three times as many boxes in 30 foot high buildings as I can in 10. So when I rented places, um, I got really great bargains per cubic foot, even though the square foot was the same as a 10-foot building. And two, I gave certain incentives to the new customers to move into my building. And that's when our business started growing. So what business are you really in is an important thing to add, ask yourself and an important question to get to, because that's how you can not only... Uh, sell your service or product, but where it's done, where it's manufactured, where it's rented, and things of that nature. You have to know what business you're really in. Well, and it changed your perspective on how your pricing was, how you're winning customers. It changed your perspective in what game you're uh, playing. Everything. And everybody will. Everybody thinks they may be in one business, but they're really in another business. So... Um, as you are building this business and you guys, what was the top line revenue and the amount of employees or like, what was the size of the business as you had kind of built it to a capacity? So it's really, it's really interesting that, um, the business, uh, was, uh, uh, turned out the top line in the business was $25 million. I eventually sold it for $110 million, uh, because the EBITDA was amazing. Um, in, in the business. The EBITDA was uh, uh, was about $10 million. Wow. So, yeah. So <laughs> what I said before, I wanted to do... Well, what I, what I told you before, I wanted to do a $100 million business. I never dreamt of selling it for $100 million. So <laughs> right. the business I started, I did $120 million and, you know, it went bankrupt. <laughs> this business, I did $25 million and sold it for $100 million. I like the second situation a lot better. And, and wait, there's more to that than, than, than meets the eye because along the way, I, I uh, it sat on real estate that I've um, that's been just publicized in the New York Times that I I'm selling to the city for 160 million dollars. Wow. So yeah, wow was right. <laughs> so so, um, so this was at one heck of a business. Yeah, that's a lot better than a hundred twenty million dollar top line making no money. Yeah, unbelievable, right? So your journey to these figures is an interesting one. So, first of all, question like, how did you? What was the what was the triggering event that started the conversations down the down the or or the eventual sale of your business? Well, that's really interesting. So, um, I, I've told my children that this business was never going to be for them right from the beginning. I told them while they went to school, they could work in the business. After they were in school, they couldn't work in the business. I was, I didn't build this business for them. I had no intention of passing this business on to them. Um, period. I would help them uh, start their own businesses. I'd help them, you know, w either with, with help or with money, but they weren't going to be in my business. Um, so I built this business to sell this business eventually. So one day I was in an, um, an industry meeting. By that time, I had started writing already. 
and I, I was a keynote speaker at the industry that year, and the head of the largest um, um, uh, competitor, it's called Iron Mountain, that was the largest in the world, it still is the largest in the world, the chairman of the board was there, and they were doing roll-ups and buying businesses. Um, this goes back uh, many, many years ago. And I said to him, jokingly around, is, um, you know, I want you to buy my business for $33 million. And he says, are you serious? I said, yeah, I'm serious. He, see, he asked me one question. He, he says, is it worth $33 million? I said, hell no. And he laughed. <laughs> <laughs> he says, well, I don't understand. <laughs> so I said, well, you can help me make it worth $33 million. And he laughed again, and I gave the talk the next day, and I guess he liked it. And he came up to me, and he says, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll make a deal. He says, if you'll send me quarterly financial statements, he says, and when the business is worth $33 million, if you want to still sell, he says, I want to crack at it with it, like everybody else, and I will take a look at your business now and value it. Hmm. and maybe give you some pointers. So I said, sure. His name was Richard Reese. He was the chairman of the board of Iron Mountain. About a month later, he came down with four people from his crew. He personally came down. And uh, they stayed there for about three, four days. He stayed for a half a day. And they came back, and they gave us suggestions how our business, the value of our business, would be worth more if we did certain things. Our contracts weren't in the right form, um, all sorts of tips that I would have never had to increase the value of our business. And to my word, I kept um, sending him quarterly financial statements. One day, about um, three years later, he gives me a call. He says, all right, business is worth $33 million. Let's talk. I said, Richard, I'm not ready to sell. He <laughs> laughed. I laughed. And, um, and uh, you know, about four years later, I sold the business. Not to him, by the way. I sold the business uh, for $110 million. And that story I wrote, it was a major story I wrote in uh, the magazine. It was uh, ended up on, uh, it was a cover story, but it was over... Uh, Ten issues, I think. Oh, Ink Magazine. Same. It's a. I when Bo when I heard that <laughs> story, it, it's crazy. Like I couldn't. First of all, the the things that are unconventional about sending quarterly statements to your competitor is one thing. Yeah. And yeah. then, <laughs> which what did that feel like? First of all. Well, everybody everybody told me I was crazy. My father in law, <laughs> uh, who was alive at the time, was a really he's a retailer and a really nice, smart guy. He says, "What are you nuts?" <laughs> I, I said, what do you mean? He says, why do you tell, in the magazine, why do you tell everybody your secrets and stuff? I said, it's not going to stop me from growing. And if they want to do it, they can do it too, you know? Um, so I, I've always been very open when it comes to that sort of stuff. I, I've, I found over the years it's helped more than it's hurt um, doing it. Um, and so I had no compunction about ever about doing this what what was there to hide mm -hmm. you know so I instead of doing uh you know uh if i if i bragged and told everybody i was in a, in a 10 million sales area and i only did 8 million what did i care about the truth mm -hmm. you know meaning that my, my this guy he he never showed anybody my financials so i didn't think he would you know um so i i wasn't afraid of that so what and, and what, look at the response that I got from it. I mean, I got help from the largest mm -hmm. company in the world. They sent a team down to help me. I mean, think about that. Well, yeah, nothing. that's awesome. It, well, Zappos has got the same story when they opened up all of their margins, all their financials to all their suppliers and vendors, so they could all work together to to hit the numbers that they wanted to. Well, Jack Stack, the same thing. Open Book Management mm -hmm. that he does it to their employees. I, I think that people are afraid of the wrong thing. You know, people are afraid of, um, you know, I used to write about all these innovations we did and stuff like that. 
you know, uh, a niche that you get a niche in business, it doesn't last forever. Everybody finds out about it eventually. Mm-hmm. So once you have it and you've innovated it into your business, uh, it's okay to tell other people. They're going to find out about it anyway. So what? What you know? For you know, fast forward to that four years when you got into the relationship with Bose, uh, right? Or that that story, the ten issue story about you potentially selling your business. Who were you going to sell to? What triggered that? Uh, that process. So again, I was at an industry convention, and there was a uh, there was uh, it was the roll ups in our industry at that time was really big. And an outfit, as a matter of fact, I'm having lunch with the guy who um, who owns the, the outfit that, that was going to buy it. He called me this week. I haven't spoken to him in a number of years. And he says, you know, I have your picture on the cover of Inc. magazine about our deal. He says, I look at it. He says, every day when I come to work. And he says, that's the one that got away. I said, well, don't feel bad, Chris. Since I sold the company. It's been sold four times and each time for a lesser amount. So I did you a favor by calling off the deal. So he, he <laughs> laughed about that. But um, it was really interesting when I when I uh, when I went to an industry meeting and I met this uh, guy who uh, um, uh, had a fund that wanted to buy our business. And he says, is your business for sale? I said, yeah, it is. He says, "Well, what do you want?" I said, "I want ten times EBITDA. I'm doing a hundred. I'm doing ten million dollars." He says, "You got it." I said, "Fine. Here's my address. Send me a letter." <laughs> and so I came back, and um, I have a few minority partners. One of them, I said, "I think I just sold a business." He said, "What are you talking about?" I said, "Well, I got ten times EBITDA." <laughs> he says, "A guy offered you a hundred million for the business." I said, "Well, he said he did." So we got a letter uh, within the next few days. And it basically was a letter saying that he was going to pay us 60 or $70 million. So he says, so you want to answer it? I said, no, I don't want to answer it. He says, why? He said, that's not what the guy offered me. So eventually the guy calls me up. He says, you haven't answered my letter. I said, I made you a deal. I said, this is, he said, well, it's subject to this, that. I says, we write the letter, <laughs> which he eventually did. And it was a long story. It just didn't work out. But uh, during the course of the negotiation, they came in. It was a, it was a funny story. I mean, during the course of negotiation, they came in with you know um, uh, some agreements, and I refused to sign the one where I couldn't write about it or talk about it. And they were pretty insistent, and I said, "Then I'm not selling the business." So they agreed to it, and, and I wrote this first story. And then, after the story was published, they came into the room and they said to me, "This is the worst story." You ever read that makes us look like idiots? I said, geez, I, I didn't mean it to be that way. Um, let me let me in the next story. I'll write. I'll, I'll make you I'll, I'll I'll make sure you're not idiots. So I wrote something in the effect of the next story <laughs> saying these the, the guys who buy my part and read the thing and they think it made them look not too smart. I believe they're really smart guys. They didn't like that either. That was oh, it was it. it was absolutely hysterical. <laughs> And it got to the point where uh, the magazine, you know, magazines are published a long time in advance, especially you have to have the stories in. And so in the end, the last four or five um, columns we did, uh, they leave it open until the week before publishing the last hundred words or so. <laughs> so when people were reading it, they were getting what's basically was right up to date type of stuff. We got huge coverage for that story. You pulled the, you pulled the audience of whether you should sell or not, right? Wasn't that? Oh, the... yeah. I did lots of things. <laughs> it was the funniest thing. I had a lot of fun with it. And oh, then they, they, they said, is the story going to, is the deal going to close? I said, yes. So they put me on the cover. I was on the cover of Inc. three times. Not for that, just once for that. And they, and they put me on the cover and it didn't close. The day the magazine came out, I called off the deal. I, I can't believe that. I just love yeah, it. Nobody could. Nobody could. <laughs> well, because and I, I said the same thing to Bo. I'm like, you know, everybody thinks that everybody that has talked that I've talked to that's gone through an acquisition or when they sell their company, they feel like once they get on the deal train, they can't get off. And I'm like, well, there's a dude named Norm that was on the cover of Inc. magazine that pulled it off. So how how can you beat that? <laughs> yeah, it was it was uh, so what happened was. At the end, they pulled a little bait and switch um, 
for a few bucks. And by the time the end came, it was a very long negotiation. Uh, the company was growing and it was worth more. And here these guys are trying to screw me out of a few million bucks. So I had known two guys who had sold the company to them. And I had called them in the beginning. You know, how, did, how was it? They said, well, they were fair. They were this. They were that. So I called these two guys up. And I said, did they try to screw you at the end? And both their answers were, well, they knocked off a few dollars, but it's no big deal. And I said, what? Why didn't you tell me this at the beginning of this thing? Well, we didn't think it was a big deal. They said, and, you know, they, they were part of this company now. So I said to them, it is a big deal. I said, they're trying to take money out of my pocket for no reason, just because it's the end of the deal. So I called them up. It was on a Thursday. I said, you have until Monday. I think the date was April 7th. You have until Monday, April 7th at noon. If you don't go back to the deal without cutting this off, the deal's off the table. I'm finished. And they didn't believe me. And uh, Monday at noon, I called a, a staff meeting. My whole staff knew I was going to do this, sell it. And I called them in. I said, be, be, be in the office at 5 of noon in the conference room, and they came up to the conference room, and as the clock struck noon, I said, I'm pulling this deal off right now. I want you to know, because they had money, you know, money coming into the deal, mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll decide what we're going to do. At a quarter after 12, these guys called, and they said, well, we want to talk to you, we want to do the deal, you know, I, I said, it's past noon, I'm not talking to you. No, no, you don't understand, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, if, if today was a, I think a Wednesday, I said Friday, come up for the weekend early. Yeah, I'll get hotel rooms, bring your lawyers up, and we'll close over this weekend. No, that's not the way to do it. Blah blah. blah. I said deal's off. That's it, and the deal was off, and we ended up selling it for more money to another person. And did in, you did you jump right in back December. into that deal then? Did you go right into yeah, December? Well, that was April, December. We closed okay. December twenty first of that year. 2007 we closed that was almost 10 years ago so tell me about like you know what was the thoughts that were going through your head and like how their actions and the if you want to call it the lack of integrity or consistency on their word how did that what were you envisioning of what the deal would look like after it went i mean I, you had to have had well, some well, you see when somebody um goes back on their word of one thing you have to assume they're going to go back on their word in a lot of things mm-hmm so, you know, we had built this culture for the company. We wanted it to exist. Um, eventually, we sold the company um, to a public company, New York Stock Exchange Company, and continued running the company. I ran it for two years. The guy who is my um, one of my partners, minority partners, uh, ended up running it for another four years after that. So, uh, and all the employees stayed and everything stayed the same. Nobody really knew. They knew I sold, but it, it wasn't, you know, like it was the end of things. Mm -hmm. So uh, once somebody doesn't keep their word on one thing, you have to assume they're not going to keep it on lots of things. And a lot of these deals, even though they're in writing, you know, a lot of them uh, are what you believe is going to happen to your company afterwards. Once you sell something and you're no longer involved with it, even if you're involved in it and you're a contract employee, you really have no say. So you have to, if you're going to sell, we could have sold to a strategic partner uh, and the company would have been just decimated. Or, so we, we decided not to sell to a, to a strategic partner because of the fact we could have gotten even more money if we sold. We decided to sell uh, to an investor type of person so they would keep the company the same. I think that's a ton of wisdom just in what you had said. And if people will take that and learn from it, they'll, they'll be able to better their situation. Cause I think you were spot on in a lot of those, a lot of those pieces during that whole getting, letting go of your baby. I mean, you'd put a lot. Yeah. Of yeah. It, listen, you know, the question that you ask yourself, and if you read those articles, it is, is, am I, my company is my company, me, do I, do I exist in a life without that? You know, because here you are, uh, you control a big company, lots of people work for you, uh, and um, it's a real big ego. It's really part of, or most of your life, 
is there life after that? And and people don't think about that. Forget about the money for a second. Um, if you're fortunate to sell your company uh, and have enough money, see the problem for a lot of people with selling their companies are that they don't even realize how much money they make. Uh, lots of people come to me for help and stuff like that. And I said, well, how much do you take out of the company? And they said, oh, we take out say, $100,000. I said, no, you don't. They said, what do you mean? How do you know? I said, I ran companies my whole life. I'm sure you're taking out closer to 200000 mm-hmm. And so, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, and then I go through a litany, a list of things that they do. Oh, yeah, I do that. Oh, yeah, I do that. I said, well, when you don't own a company anymore, you're not taking it out anymore. So here's what you're getting. You're selling your company for $5 million. And uh, you're going to have to pay taxes on that and this and that. And here's what you have left. And you're, uh, you know, 48 years old. You're going to have to start a new company. And you don't have enough money to start a new company with. <laughs> you know? It's pretty so, eye-opening. It, well, it's very eye-opening. Uh, it, that's why you can't really go to, like, a business broker or something. All they want to do is make a commission and sell it. you you got to find out what it's all about beforehand. Well, because because you, of the fact that, you know, if you're young and you built a company and, you know, you think you're going to get $10 million and you think that's a lot of money, uh, not I'm not saying it isn't, by the way, but but if you're making, you know, three four $400,000 and taking out another hundred or hundred and fifty and other things, uh, you're not going to have enough to live on. And you're not going to have enough to possibly build another company. So you, you have to understand uh what what you're taking from your company too before you sell it, and you have to make plans. The plan, time to plan to sell a company. Unfortunately, most people don't do this. Is at least five uh, to seven years before you sell it, um, because most people do it. They do it maybe because they have to, or they get old enough. To, they don't make plans to do it, you know. And and, and they got to do that. They got to start that now. So what a you know. You know, I 100% agree with everything you said because of the situation that we were in. We were kind of you, – you had control over your whole situation, which I think everybody wants. As an entrepreneur, you want control, right? You want control over your situation. Oh, that's why you're in business for yourself. <laughs> right, right. And, you know, pl- the planning and finding out your numbers, finding out all, where all the, the variables lie puts you back into the negotiation spot. Um, so I 100% agree with everything you said. And one thing that I'm curious, you know, as you – you know, as you succeeded with this sale and as you transitioned out, what were your plans for afterwards? You know, it's been 10 years, like you said, and you've built and uh, are running or have run 13, 12 to 14 companies. What did you want to do next? I mean, how did you determine what you wanted to do? I mean, you've got lots of money, which means you've got a lot of different options. So how have you, yeah. how have you transitioned into a life after business that allows you to keep all of this stuff into perspective? So I was lucky in a way. I, I, I ran my company for two more years um, after afterwards. I mean, I really ran it. The, the, the investors that bought the company didn't interfere at all. Um, and they would have uh, hired me for another two years. But I didn't want to anymore. I wanted to do other things. So I, I, I wanted to start other businesses. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to speak a little bit more. Um, uh, you know, I... I do things differently today than I did then. I, I don't think I would work um, full time within a company where I was tethered to a desk anymore. Uh, I partner up. Uh, first of all, I'm a f- control freak like most uh, <laughs> entrepreneurs. So I, I go into deals that, you know, people come to me all the time with deals. And usually I say to them, to people come to me with two things. One, help. I do pro bono um, help to anybody who wants it. Um, and I've been doing that close to 20 years. Um, the other thing is uh, people come to me to be an investor. So like I said, I'm a control freak. So before anybody sits down, I said, let me just tell you what uh, I insist on, no exceptions. Uh, I own 51% of the company. So usually before I even say the next sentence, which I'll tell you in a second, because, oh, no, this is a different type of deal. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I laugh. There is no different types of deals for me. You know? <laughs> now, I, I must admit I do make exceptions whereby I might put up 50 or 100 grand to help somebody out in something. But normally that 
I don't even do that. So I have to have 51% of control. And, and the entrepreneur does have an opportunity to get control back from me once my hmm. capital is paid back. Hmm. Um, so, so, so I, I do that. that. That's the thing. And so I get young uh, entrepreneurs – a lot of times, as I've known them for periods of time, either I work with them or help them or et cetera, and uh, they, they, it's their full-time job. It's not mine, uh, even though I work. Uh, the thing we're working on now that's about five and a half years ago we started it is a chain of restaurants called Fast Casual, a uh, Japanese restaurant called Kobayaki. We're in four locations now, about to be eight. Hmm. And and after five and a half years, we're just starting to roll it out. That's interesting. Um, you, what? Uh, that's because of the restaurant industry, which everybody says well, that's the last thing you want to do because of the yeah. o- op- owner operated and all the all the cash. It's it, it because it relies so much on cash. I mean, why restaurants? Just kind of curious. So I've been in restaurants before. This is not my first foray into restaurants. And it has nothing to do with why restaurants. It has to do with people. <laughs> so I think that, that you find the right people. Um, the guy who, who's one of my partners has been um, working with me for the last uh, uh, 15 years. And uh, he, was, he was one of the lead guys in bringing this to me. So he works there full time. He's very smart, very bright, and he's very good. So... Um, you know, every business is hard. Restaurant brings some additional glitches to it. So you're uh, having but, fun? Overall having fun with it? Yeah, I am having fun with it. We had, uh, we opened, the first two we opened up were smash hits. The third one sucked. And so we had to learn. The first two we opened the doors and didn't have to do anything. The third one, I let, wouldn't let them open up another one until they learned how to drive traffic to it. Cool. So, yes, it's been a great learning experience. And I think that it has a chance of being something. Um, so we'll see. We're probably about uh, two years away from either uh, going to outside investment, not being up big, or franchising it, or something of that nature. But everything's in place. You know, manuals, training films, uh, the way we uh, uh, get the food. Uh, there's a lot of things. That had to go into place. So the first restaurant we opened up, we worked on things for years just to get it right, so it could be uh, some sort of uh, uh, a big chain. I love it, Norm. I got to tell you, we could probably talk for hours, and I'm going to have to have you back on the show because I enjoyed it so much. And good. No, I, I. If there's one thing you would leave our listeners with that we haven't touched on, you know, what would that be? So I'll, I'll leave. Every entrepreneur with the same or would be entrepreneur with the same thing. Never, 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 never give up. Never quit. You know, a lot of times things get very difficult. And I'm not saying that every business works. um, But um, if it doesn't, start another one. Uh, The one bad thing about going through and becoming an entrepreneur, um, once you start, you don't have a choice. You're going to be that for the rest of your life. Because <laughs> what happens is you develop bad habits. You don't listen to anybody. You come and go as you want. Um, so <laughs> if you start down this path, just remember it's going to be for a lifetime. And, uh, you know, I, I've had some really horrendous times, but I wouldn't trade those times for anything else. And, and I loved doing what I did my entire life. And, you know, a lot of my friends who I went to law school with uh, are, are still jealous um, because it's a great life and, and it's and it's fabulous. And uh, like I said before, I think that today, particularly, uh, most people want to be self-dependent upon themselves. And what better way to do that than starting your own business? I love it. Norm, if there's a way for our listeners to get in touch with you, what would it be? So two ways. One, uh, Twitter. It's at Norm Brodsky. Or two, my email address, old fashioned. It's Brodsky, B R O D S K Y, one three at AOL.com. Norm, my thanks so much. Still well, laughing. Oops, my sorry, kids what? still laugh at me when I use AOL. But. I got to admit that I, I loved it when I saw it came over, but 
Bose was also at AOL, so it didn't surprise me that much. But it was, <laughs> <laughs> I did love it, though. That's uh, good. Thank you, Brian, for having me on. Thank you so much for coming on. Dude.